I am Naeem Culver. I'm extension soil health specialist out of Langdon. With me is Dr. Abby Vick. She is our state soil health specialist. And is Scott Swenson, who is helping us with the Zoom. He's the IT specialist. They both uh, work out of uh, Fargo. So welcome to the second webinar of our NDSU Zoom soil health webinar series. Last Tuesday, we had our first one. And if you were not able to join that, uh, that webinar is available through YouTube. Today we are having a second one. And then for the next two weeks, we'll have four more. And it's starting at 11 Tuesdays and Thursdays. Just as a reminder that each webinar will have one pre-recorded presentation and we'll follow that up uh, with some question answers or any discussions you guys wanted to have. So for today, Again, we are gonna be focusing on the uh, challenges which were created by the wet weather last fall, as well as we are facing some of these issues this is spring. So last Tuesday, Dr. Day talked about these challenges by comparing different uh, tillage practices. Today, we'll have Abby talk about, uh, say for example, what should we do with wet fields by using cover crops. So that presentation will go on for about 27 minutes. And then we'll again, um, you know, leave it uh, open for questions and answers or discussions. If you needed to ask questions while we were playing the video, uh, please type the questions in your chat box. So like Abby, I, I won't be able to do that because I would be sharing a screen, but Abby can actually answer the question while uh, her presentation is playing. Um, for you guys. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen first. So I'm glad to be here today to talk about soil health practices and how they might help with wet fields. Um, I feel like everybody's kind of looking at their fields this year and they may be a, a precipitation event away from from being flooded or thinking about maybe the future if we consist, consistently are wet as to what management practice they, practices they could use. So um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about how soil health practices can help um, help us manage moisture in the fields. Um, so including reducing tillage and also using cover crops. Um, so this picture on the bottom of this actually opening slide is a field that I was in this fall um, on a high clay soil in the southern Red River Valley. And this is a field where they've been using uh, no-till for about five years or six years um, and incorporating cover crops in every part of the rotation. And you can see the standing water out here um, in this field. It's obviously post soybean harvest. And then the tracks of where we drove across this field and actually through the standing water. And I can tell you, I was really, I mean, I love soil health, but I was kind of nervous driving across this field because I thought, boy, what if we get stuck or, you know, it, and then I just, as we went across the field, it was, it was not a problem. We had great traffic ability and the field, the structure of the field was set up really well. And so, um, so I wanted to share some of these experiences and things that I've seen over the past couple of years um, in hopes that maybe they'll help you pick some of the practices that you may want to try on your farms if you have wet conditions. Um, so here's that field again uh, with cover crops, no-till, and actually no, it's not any tile installed under this field. Um, and then across the road, we've got a field that does have tile installed in it, but is using uh, full tillage uh, to crop rotation, and, you, and they also use tracks to harvest uh, their soybean crop. And so these fields were harvested, they're literally right across the road from each other. Um, they were harvested uh, within a day of each other and uh, both had soybean, both have very similar soil types. I actually would argue that this this field with the no-till is actually a more challenging soil than the one across the road. Um, but definitely, you know, the concern of trafficability at harvest is, is, is a major one and it's something that we need to prepare for and use all the tools we can to get to the point where we don't have to worry so much about it. Um, but but to know that, that our fields are gonna carry our equipment. And so I think this is a really great visual because it shows literally across the road, um, very similar soil types, same crop, same harvest time, one harvested with tracks, um, and that's the field with the tile drainage under it. And then the other one harvested actually, um, they were in, in four wheel drive on the combine, but they do not have tracks. So, um, so this is a great example of how these soil health practices can actually help uh, during harvest. Um, here's another photo again from the Southern Red River Valley where um, we have two fields again that were harvested about the same time. Um, 
both were in soybean again in this year. I think this was 2018 and another wet fall for harvest. And this field on the left um, has been in, in no-till again for, for not a long period of time. Not, it's not a 40-year no-till field. It's actually under 10 years, um, probably about five years. And again, cover crops included in rotation. And they harvested this field in two-wheel drive and they loaded all their trucks on the field and not on the road. Um, so this is a really great example, again, of how structure is helping them build, um, build their soil so they have better trafficability, how the cover crops are adding roots, they're managing moisture. Um, they're really helping in this situation to, to make it less of a headache at harvest. Um, this field across the road was harvested uh, with a combine with traps on it um, and has a, gosh, I think a corn, oops, excuse me, a corn soybean wheat rotation. I had to figure out how to go back. Um, and you can see how they, they, they just squiggled around this field and they had a really challenging time. You can see the ruts that were left um, in this field and they loaded their trucks on the road. Um, so again, soil health building practices really helping create a, a situation that's desirable at harvest. Um, here's another example of, of practices that are being used where cover crops are being flown on into soybean. Um, so kind of a preventative um, approach where you fly in cover crops prior to leaf drop in soybean uh, to get something green and growing underneath the, the crop that you're going to harvest. Um, so this really helps with trafficability. It helps with, um, with just, yeah, basically getting across the field and having something green to drive on. And granted, this is a really, really good catch of cover crops in soybean. Um, sometimes we don't see this, especially if the canopy is, is very closed and the cover crops can't establish. Um, this is on 15 inch row spacing, so they had a little bit of room in there for the, for the cover crops to get going. Um, and using this practice, I would really recommend selecting a cover crop that's going to stay low to the ground. So in this case, it's cereal rye. I think there's some radish in there and some dwarf Essex rapeseed and some flax. Um, but all those are going to stay low to the ground, fairly, fairly low to the ground and, and not in, interfere with harvest. Um, or stain any of the beans or anything. So, um, but this was a really great field, a uh, great catch of cover crops. Again, if it's, if you have the right conditions, you get a great catch when you broadcast. If you are very dry, you may not get a good catch, or if the canopy is too shaded, um, you might not get establishment under there. Um, there's also, you know, the concern of field access in, in a wet spring, and um, what tools can you use to, to make that situation better? Um, so here's, again, two fields side by side um, in the Red River Valley. So I apologize for those of you that are out of the Red River Valley, but I feel like a lot of the conditions we have and that we apply here in the valley could be applied anywhere in some, in some cases. So we've had some really wet conditions and we have some very high clay soils creating some huge challenges. Um, so this is where we have on the left side, we have a field, this one is tiled. Um, full tillage practices use two crop rotation. And here on the right, we have a field that has a four crop rotation, use of, of no-till and cover crops. Um, so when we look at access in the spring, and especially a wet spring, and we look on the tools we're relying on to manage those fields, in a situation where you're using tillage and not using cover crops, you're, you're really relying on evaporation. And I say just evaporation in this field, even though it's tiled, because there's a compaction layer that's not allowing that water to get down to the tile line. So this field, though it could be relying on evaporation plus infiltration to get to the, to move water through the tile lines, it's really just relying on evaporation because that water has nowhere to go. It can't go into the soil because um, of the tillage history on that field. When we look at the one next to it, where we're using soil health practices like reduced tillage and cover crops, we have three modes of action for, for water movement. Uh, we have transpiration by the plants. So the cereal rye that was seeded the fall prior that is overwintered um, is now growing in the spring. It's transpiring moisture to get it out of the field. We also still have some evaporation because of, of course the, the rye cover is not uh, fully closed on that field. So we're getting some evaporation. And we're also getting that infiltration or the water movement down through the soil, soil pores to a tile line if you had tile installed or to get it out of the, the uh, planting zone. So I'd rather rely on three modes of action for moving water than one. And this just gives you more opportunity to get moisture out of the field. Um, here's, here I am walking in the field. Uh, this is something I like to do, I guess, as soon as the field is really wet and it's a no-till field, I'll walk across it and I'm, I'm in the middle of the field, literally. 
uh, when this drone shot was taken. And I, here's my boot coming out of the field. Uh, you can see very little mud on it at all. Um, it was easy to walk across. Granted, I'm not the weight of a comb or a, a tractor, which thankfully I'm not, but, um, but I think that that same trackability is seen with heavy equipment as well. Um, here is the field next to it that is full tillage that, um, that I, this is the first step I took in that field and I didn't, I'm smart enough not to go any further. So, um, so you can see how that trafficability, you know, that this is an indication of how that structure is holding up weight and it's holding, uh, it's creating an opportunity to get equipment in the field possibly. Um, I did want to show some moisture readings that I've had um, in fields where on the left, we're just looking at, at residue in a no-till situation. Um, in the middle, we're looking at cover crops plus no-till. Um, and then on the right, we're looking at full tillage. And this was a dry, fairly dry spring, because one of them we have 0% moisture. Um, on the left, we have, with just the residue, we're sitting at, at saturated. So 50% moisture is pretty much saturated. That means all the pores are full in that soil. Um, so you can see the residue is, is, it's doing its part to protect the soil, but it's not helping us manage moisture. Um, and this must have been a wet condition if it was saturated. It's not helping us manage moisture in that wet condition. Um, here in the middle, if we add in a cover crop like cereal rye, which would be seeded the fall before, um, this, and then coming up, this would be in the spring, uh, we see we can cut that moisture in half. Uh, by using by using a cover crop, and I think that gives a safety net maybe to to going to no-till, knowing that you're going to have something there to help use the moisture. Um, but also at the same token, it can be kind of dangerous because if the rye uses too much moisture, you can get into a really dry seed bed. And so it's really important if you're using cereal rye as a tool that you don't just plant it and forget it, um, but to make sure that you're going back to check and see how much moisture is left and to terminate that rye with a herbicide. Um, if, if you feel like the moisture is, if the planting, or sorry, the seedbed is getting too dry. And then on the right here, we have, um, you know, just this, this soil is very exposed to wind erosion. Um, it didn't have any residue to protect it or keep moisture. It didn't have a cover crop managing moisture. You can actually see some of these um, dots back here, like this one is a seed. Um, so it had been planted and now the seed is being exposed through wind erosion because the soil is just so dry and it was easily being blown away. Um, so just a, a great example of how to manage how to manage moisture using you know what it might be without cover crops with cover crops and then without uh, residue or cover crops. So the, another concern you know is the trafficability of planting um, as we've kind of been talking about. So here's um, you know seeding soybean into a living cereal rye. Um, I really like this approach, um, and especially for high clay soils, because it gives you a chance to manage moisture, it improves trafficability. Uh, we're fairly confident, and we've taken enough measurements, and there's been enough research done to say that this practice does not hurt yield unless the termination timing on the rye is off. So say, um, say you have a really dry spring, you have a lot of rye out there, it uses too much moisture, the, the soybean that you planted into it has a difficult time getting established, um, then you're looking at uh, being maybe a growth stage behind. Um, and in the northern parts of the state, we can't afford to be a growth stage behind. So, um, so I think, you know, rye requires management for sure, if you're going to do planting green. Um, we also know that if we're using cereal rye, that we are not planting corn into this. Um, I'll show you some ways to get around that maybe, but uh, we're not putting corn into living cereal rye, the competition, the nitrogen tie-up, um, all those all those factors are, are just are, are too much for it and you'll lose yield potentially. Um, and we're also not putting wheat on a rye field for, for reasons of seed contamination. So um, so this really is specific to broadleaf crops like soybean. Um, some farmers are using it with sunflowers, but they may be using strip till into their rye to get it away from the sunflower. Uh, there's some some use of this with edible beans as well. Um, so it's just, it's, it's a good approach. It's something that probably is a way if you're gonna get into this, if you're not into it already, uh, it's a good, a good gateway to using cover crops and also reducing tillage. Um, there's also a concern about, you know, establishing cover crops with a late season harvested crop. So, so corn specifically, you know, we don't have enough time after harvest um, to get a cover crop seeded, uh, especially this year since there are still standing fields. Um, so interseeding is really a great, a great approach in, in corn. Um, so here is an, another example. This is actually in the sandy soil of right Jamestown. Um, and you can see here on the left, we have a 30 pound 
uh, rate of cereal rye that was broadcast into corn at side dress. Um, and then on the right, we have a 60 pound rate. So you can see the difference in the rates. Um, this field actually got hailed on two or three times in the growing season. So in a lot of ways, it was nice to have this rye there to compete with weeds since the canopy was, was, so, was opened up and the soils were exposed. Um, but I, I like the idea of looking at two different rates. Um, and this farmer has since, they did this as a, a strip, did strips of it at first to try it out. And then they started adopting this practice to using um, the higher rates of rye broadcast into lower parts of the field where, the, where they may have higher clay or more moisture. And then on their sandier hilltops, they were, I think got down to 10 pounds of rye that they were broadcasting at side dress time. So, um, so really customizing the rye that they're seeding or broadcasting to fit the, the soil types on the field and, and moisture management uh, conditions. And so this is how it looked in the spring. Um, so here we have on the, on the hilltop, we're using you know, 10 pounds that was broadcast and then hit the lower part of the field or the side slope, we're using 60 pounds. Um, so that's a really nice compromise to avoid using too much moisture in the spring, especially on, um, on sandier soils where you can't afford to lose lose moisture when rye really gets growing and cranking. So uh, this is a nice way to get around that uh, practice or around that issue and or concern and um, and to really customize for the field. And I don't think he created any kind of map for this. I think he just flipped the switch or adjust the rates as he was going across the field. Um, he had a, a double tank on his uh, side dress unit so he could put rye in, in one tank and he could put the, the fertilizer in the other and, and it worked really well for him. Um, you know, there's also a concern that people have about when you go to the effort of interseeding a cover crop and um, and then you harvest and does the residue that lays on top of it inhibit it from growing or using extra moisture or, or kind of snuff out the cover crop. And the first key to that is, is residue management. Um, if you have something seeded between the corn rows, leave the corn stalk standing, uh, turn off the chopping head, leave as you know little residue free residue kind of floating around on the ground as possible and this is this is something you know almost every farmer i work with that is in a no-till system um, and is using cover crops turns the chopping head off and they leave the stalk standing they can deal with residue better when it's attached to the ground and standing than they can if it's laying on the ground and blowing around um, so this is this is a great example um, of, of doing that and then having the cereal rye and radish really start growing once they're once the, the crop is harvested and then they're exposed to more sunlight. But residue management, and, and all this really, residue management is, is key and that should be your first consideration um, when using reduced tillage or cover crops. Um, here's another concern of using water and getting the soils to warm up with residue. So I think a lot of people that have wheat residue in the field can, can have this concern. Um, we often talk about wheat as being a great place to include cover crops after harvest because of the time that we have to get that, co that cover crop growing. Um, but again, it starts with residue management. Um, make sure that you're cutting the wheat as high as you can if you're, uh, if you're not using a stripper head and make sure you, you know, if you need to, you can run a drag across the field and just let it fill up with the residue and then dump it at the end of the field and remove it. Um, there's ways to get around this. Um, a stripper head is a nice option, and, and I don't think I have a picture of that, but it leaves the residue standing very tall, um, and it, it keeps the residue off the ground. Um, but here, we did what's called bio strip till, and it was a way to, to really, well, to basically plant cover crops on 30 inch row spacing and wheat residue to go to corn the next year. Um, and we wanted to do that because the equipment we had, we could use residue managers to push the residue aside, um, to give a little bit of a black strip. We didn't, you know, set them deep into the soil. We didn't want to cut into the soil. We just wanted to kind of push it aside and then replace that where the residue is pushed aside with a cover crop. And so here we have radish and fava bean and flax um, and 30 inch row spacing. And this field went to corn the following year. Um, this is another great way to uh, cut back on the cost of your mix because you're not seeding it over the whole field, but you're just putting it in the strips uh, where you're going to seed your next year's cash crop. Um, so this is how those strips looked. Um, this would have been in the, in the fall after a frost. Um, so the, the black residue in here is actually fava bean. And that's a nice, it's a legume. If you're going to use it, you should inoculate it. Um, 
but it, the residue turns really dark and brown. And so initially when I look at this, I could almost mistake this for strip till because we can see our 30 inch row spacing, um, even as we kind of get over here and here and here. Um, but it's a nice way to use residue to replace the mechanical um, use uh, tillage using strip till. And then if you look over here, we have actually chisel plows check strips. So I'm gonna show you some data from this on, on soil warming and moisture. But we had uh, chisel plow check strips across the field. This is from the, the share farm project that we have down in Morton. So here, let's see, this is some data that Aaron Day and Nate Derby collected. Um, and so I had them, we had temperature and moisture sensors in the soil um, pretty much all year. And one of the things that they did is they set up these sensors between the strips and just the residue within the strips where we had the, um, the cover crop seeded, and then we had sensors in the chisel plow strips. Um, and they think they had them from zero to five, they had them at five centimeters and also at 15 centimeter depth. So we'll stick with a five centimeter because that's right at the surface. And I think that's the, where we really need these practices to work the most. Um, so let's see, if we look here, the gray are the readings from between the strips. The orange is within the cover crop strip. And then the, the blue is actually just set at zero because these are all relative to what it would be with a chisel plow. Um, so we don't have the chisel plow readings, but we, we uh, I don't know what you call it, normalized or whatever. We, we made this, these readings in reference to the chisel plow. And I had them just look at the fall because that's where the cover crop is growing and that's where we're using moisture and trying to manage moisture before going into winter. So if we look at the moisture content relative to chisel plow for the between strips, you can see that it's significantly, um, it's significantly higher. And if we look at it um, within the strips where we have the cover crops, look how much that dried the soil and made it more similar to the chisel plow than if we just had the residue. And so I think that this is a really great tool um, to dry, some, dry those strips that we're going to plant into the next year, um, get some of that excess moisture out, um, and, and just really focus your cover crops on, on a single strip in the fall. If we look at the temperature in the spring, so these dates you can see are up till May, the sensors were pulled at planting around May 15th, and then these are where the sensors are after. Um, so again, orange is within the strips, the, the gray is between the strips under the residue, and then we have the chisel plow line here um, in blue. And if we look at before, there's really not much difference. Um, there's no difference at all really uh, between, or bit with the, within strips, um, cover crops, and the chisel plow. We do see differences in the residue and the relative to the chisel plow. So um, I think we, we're looking here that, it, that the residue would be colder, significantly colder than it would be in the chisel plow. If we move over to after planting, um, which the farmer thought this field planted great when he put it into corn, um, you can see that the in strips um, and underneath the cover crop strips, it said it's actually, um, it would be considered the same as chisel plow because um, we see it's not significantly different, but we see a really nice um, trend there. And then also between the strips with residue now, it's, it's again, it's not different. And that may be because of the, the row cleaners that ran across. Um, well, no, that wouldn't have been run across there. Would it? That would be between the, where the corn was seeded. So uh, we see things kind of even out um, after planting in, in May. But I think this is really promising to see, um, to see some of these changes in temperature by using this practice. And then there are other ways to kind of establish strips if you're into that kind of thing. Um, here's where, where cereal rye was seeded um, in 30 inch row spacing, and then they came back in and planted between the rye rows. Um, so and before we were planting on the cover crop row, now we're planting between it. And this was an attempt to get the rye away from um, sunflower, which I think is what was planted in this field. Um, you could probably do a similar thing with corn as well, um, but we have not tested that. But if you're, if you're, you know, if you're insistent on planting corn into rye, then this is what I would do. I get the rye away from where you're gonna be planting the corn. Um, you could also, use strip tillage or residue managers in the spring to kind of get that rye away um, from the, the corn roots or from uh, sunflowers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's also a concern of using cover crops on prevent plants. And I think, you know, given how wet we are this spring, I think we, we need to start thinking about prevent plants in some fields where we're going to have to use this. 
Um, so I've seen a lot of different fields where we've used diverse mixes that are full season then also um, monocultures or, or two species um, as a full season. And so let's take a look at some of that. Um, first, I think, I think you choose whether you're going to do a cover crop mix or use a monoculture based on your weed pressure in that field. And so um, you obviously want to start with a clean field. So you're going to make sure that you've done a herbicide pass, that the weeds are cleaned up, um, that you're not going to have a bunch of cover crops and weeds. And then you would either seed your, your diverse mix or a monoculture. If you have a really high weed pressure in, those, in, in a specific field, then you may want to just use a monoculture. Um, so that, you know, if you use a grass, so you can come back in with a broadleaf herbicide um, and manage that field throughout the growing season, um, that may be the, 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 a good approach to use. Um, if you have a field that has relatively low weed pressure, you could always do a, a cover crop mix. And it doesn't have to be expensive and the rates don't have to be very high. So here's an example of a radish turnip sunflower O to P mix that was by the Enderlin area, 20 bucks an acre. And I think I saw very few weeds in this field. It got, they got great coverage. They're very happy. Again, their weed pressure on this field was fairly low to begin with. Um, so they, they went with a diverse mix and, uh, and they got a really nice establishment. Here's that same farmer had another field where he had higher weed pressure and he actually seeded cereal rye uh, in the middle of the summer. And the nice thing about that is that cereal rye will stay very low to the ground because it needs vernalization to, to really sprout up and, and head out. So um, a 40 to 50 pound rate, 10 bucks an acre, got the field covered, sprayed it with herbicide once um, after the cover crop was established. And then that rye started growing again this spring and managing moisture. So um, that was a really great tool on that field and he felt like on that one he didn't want to spend a bunch of money and it was just, you know, it was one that he wanted to be able to actively manage throughout the growing season. So, so really picking the right um, cover crop mix for the field conditions for what you have going on. Um, we have a lot more information on this on the NDSU Soil Health webpage and I'm sure we'll be coming back later this summer uh, once we get, you know, the, the rest of the crops planted. Um, we have the PP fields left. We'll come back with some more information on this so that we can guide you in that uh, in what you're going to use. Um, so that's you know that's that's what I have for for some cover crop information. I really just wanted to tailor it to what fields this spring because we're just a lot of us are dealing with so much moisture. Um, but I also want to put a few things on your calendar while while you're watching this webinar, and that's you know save the date for the Dirt Workshop or the Dakota Innovation Research and Technology Workshop, uh, which is December seventh through 9th in Fargo. Uh, we talk a lot about grazing, we talk a lot about uh, northern North Dakota, so Naeem does quite a bit of planning for up there with, with content and also salinity and sadicity. Um, we have Mary Kina and Mike Osley are going to work on the grazing section for this. Um, and, and it's just going to be, it's going to be a great meeting. We focus a lot on networking and building relationships versus just sitting through presentations and, and content. So um, really fun workshop, mark your calendars for that. And um, here's all my contact information. If you have questions, definitely give me a call um, and let me know what your questions are or send me a text. Um, my email is on here. We have the Soil Sense podcast coming out, which actually started March 1st and it'll go through, I think June is when the last one is, is released, but ndsoilsense.com if you want to listen to soil health um, experiences from farmers, consultants, research, extension. Um, and, and get some insight and ideas on what you may want to try or what you're doing and how you could tweak it a little bit. Um, but check out that resource and I think I might be, might be adding something to that soon too. So, um, so I'm kind of in the, in the works on planning a few things that will be more remotely available versus face-to-face -face since we're just not sure when we're going to be able to, to get out there again. But um, definitely give me a call or email or contact your county extension agent if you have questions. Um, and, and good luck planting and getting things done this spring. Yeah, I got a, a question on, you know, how do you determine trafficability in a field and what are the measurements for it? And, and that's a great question if there are some other researchers that are, that are on, the, on the webinar right now. Um, I haven't found a good way to do it um, because I feel like you need, you need multiple measurements to actually tease that out and create a complete story. Um, so it just seems, you know, that's one we really just kind of rely on on what the farmers are saying about their experiences during planting and, and during harvest for trafficability. But maybe somebody else um, has some ideas as well. I think one of the ways, like penetrometer is another way to check that. And then 
um, visual, just like the pictures you showed. That would be another way to see that. Um, I think Dean Steele um, had done uh, quite a bit of work on that, correct? Um, oh yeah, I think he has some kind of instrument that he can drag through um, through the soil to measure. I, I'm not sure. I, I've, it seems like kind of a challenging thing to measure. And, and you know, trafficability, a lot of times I'll, I'll go walk across these fields and I'll say, oh yeah, it held me up perfectly. It's a beautiful field. And the farmer will say, well, well, great, it held you up, but what about my equipment? You know, and what does that mean mm -hmm. for when I go out there with equipment? And, and, um, and so it really just ends up being a, maybe an experiential <coughs> measurement on, on, you know, getting familiar with it, getting, knowing what you can and can't do on different fields based on, on their level of, of aggregation and development of soil health. Um, but yeah, it'd be, it'd be great if we could really measure that. And I agree that the penetrometer can be helpful. Um, but nothing, it's, it's hard to, to mimic large yeah. equipment. I, I personally think it has to translate into the practical terms for the producers. Uh, and the best way is if they are not leaving any ruts behind um, their heavy equipment, to me, that's the best. Because whatever research we do, the ultimate objective is so that we could we could create the real practical solution for the producers. So I agree that, um, you know, the pictures you sh showed, uh, they're great examples. I can see that you, you um, there was a question about, did you say no tile on the cover crop field? And you answered that. That was to me also very interesting. You know, I've been battling, like we have this long-term um, tiling project on a saline soda piece of land. And we have found out that uh, the salt levels actually increased in 2017 and 18 compared to 16, um, despite the land being tiled because there was not enough water, which will force the salts into the deeper depths, but there was more evapotranspiration and drier weather. And that led to capillary water movement or waking up and the salts increased. So the common notion that uses tile. Tile will work if we have access water and good infiltration. Yeah. So and this I, point, yeah. And tiling right. is a great tool if it's stacked with other tools. You know, I mean, we really mm -hmm. saw some benefits this year at the Share Farm in Morton um, mm -hmm. on the tiled piece of ground when, when planting corn because, you know, we had, we had a four years of, of no-till on that field. We were using cover crops. So we have a three crop rotation um, and the, the corn was, was planted um, and it didn't, the stand didn't have any issues on the tiled part. We had to replant the southern part of the field where it, that was not tiled. Um, so it seems like there's, there's a place for tiling if it's stacked with all these other tools and you're really taking advantage of, of the water interception and the water infiltration that you can get to the tile line to remove it from the field. Um, and so I think there are a lot of benefits to it. You know, I, I get asked the question a lot of times, can you use these soil health practices without tiling? And, and I've seen it, so I would say yes, um, that you can use those practices. Uh, without tiling, but but tiling, I mean, it can help in certain fields, and there are some fields that boy, it would make some of these things a lot easier. But but I've seen some great fields that have that have done this without without the tiling in place. Um, so I, I don't want see, that, that investment yeah. to be a a point of kind of discouragement of like, well, I can't tile it, so I can't do these practices or whatever. That there's ways around it. You just have to get a pretty creative, and it takes a lot of effort too. I mean, it does it does take using all those tools. Um, together in a way that works well with your equipment and your the people you have on hand and your operation. Yeah. Somebody mentioned bulk density to um, another way to measure trafficability. Um, but I've seen that it, it doesn't really changes very quickly in a year or two, whether it, you know, decreases or increases. That's what I've seen from, because we take bulk density samples here every year. The problem with bulk density is that um, you have to have, you have to pound these rings in to get the undisturbed cores. And most of the time we check it for five to 10 um, inches and uh, sorry, zero to five inches, five to 10 inches. I wish there would be um, a way we could take slightly deeper bulk density measurements. Um, but this is what we mostly have. Is there any other unanswered question, Abby, in the chat box or are you? I don't know if, is Rob still on? Rob asked a question about uh, wheat residue management. Um, 
and, and the best way to, to go through that. So managing wheat residue, what are your general thoughts on combining by either cutting high, using a straw chopper, or heavy harrow to prep for the cover crop? Um, even the harrow tends to scatter rather than, than gather the residue. And, um, and certainly with wheat residue, I, I always kind of struggled with, with trying to incorporate cover crops after wheat. I don't know why, I was so, why I'm so scared of it, but I just feel like there's, there's so much residue there um, that I actually will incorporate cover crops um, by interseeding corn before I would go into it uh, with wheat um, because of that issue. So oh, there you are, Rob. Good. I'm glad you're you're on the screen. Do you do you want to talk a little bit more about that or what you're thinking about or your concerns or? Yeah, I I don't really have um, a personal experience or you know directly working with a grower, but I was just you know thinking in my own mind. Um, of my family and their farm. They're, they're not currently implementing a lot of cover cropping practices, but they, they are still really mindful about the residue management following wheat just to prepare for that, um, you know, for the air seeder in the next spring. And uh, if they don't pay attention to residue management, they have issues with getting the crop established. So they've combined, you know, trying to cut as high as possible with, um, but they still are using a straw chopper, but then they're running a heavy harrow after they, they harvest just to kind of spread and break things up. And um, I was just wondering if, you know, granted that's maybe not, you know, it, and I imagine there's other farmers who take a similar approach. So if, you know, a uh, stripper header is maybe the ideal uh, for being able to manage, you know, how the system I just described might compare. Yeah, well, I think that's a great system. I know a lot of farmers who are using those those practices with wheat. Um, and so it seems to work, you know, I mean, if it's, if and it sounds like too, based on what Aaron Day was saying, if you can get that residue, you know, two inches or less in thickness, that that would make a big difference for moisture in those soils. So anything you can do to get that less, that residue less than two inches, um, so you're still protecting your soil but allowing for for the water management. Um, stripper headers are are great. I know farmers that have bought them and they'll never turn back. Um, I know other farmers too that have bought them and then sold them, you know, and 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 not been happy with it for their system. Um, you know, part of the reason I think the hang up with them is that, you know, they're, they're difficult to find They're they can be expensive and they're typically only used on, on, you know, on one crop. And so I think, um, I think that's kind of a, a barrier to it, but, um, but the fields that I've seen with just leaving the residue as tall as you can and standing um, is really is, is key. Um, the other thing is header size. Um, so if we look at some of these, these, you know, 40 foot, 45 foot headers, um, you know, it's very difficult to get the residue spread out the back of the combine to match that header. Um, and so I know some farmers that have gone down to smaller headers um, to 35 foot to, to make sure that they can get a good spread on residue. Um, I know that's not ideal for everybody and it's not, um, you know, that involves a change in equipment, but I think you can get around those things just like you're saying with a, with a heavy harrow or, or some kind of drag or something like that to just, um, to get the residue spread out where you feel comfortable seeding into it and not worried about hair pinning or, um, or cover crop establishment in that, uh, in that scenario. I also thought, uh, you know, one slide, um, you had um, one mode of action compared to three. I thought that was very interesting that instead of just, you know, uh, depending upon the evaporation, because that's what we are doing. When we are doing the tillage, we are opening up the soil uh, to dry it. Um, so we are only focusing on evaporation, but when you have ev evaporation, transpiration and infiltration, I, I, I personally think, Abby, that um, I've come to learn about the importance of infiltration a lot. And that's again, a function of soil particle aggregation and its structure and everything. But I think that we, I personally think that I don't talk enough about infiltration. Infiltration is the key. You know, like for example, when we look at the wet weather, oh yeah, there's excess water, but it has to go down in the soil and infiltration is the key again there. Dry weather too. Uh, whatever rain we get, if it infiltrates into the soil, there would be more plant available water for the crops to use. Yeah, I think infiltrate, I agree with that. Infiltration is, you know, I mean, for example, some of those, you know, when I showed some of the, that one tiled field and I didn't include drainage as a mode of action to move water, that really has, it really has a, a compacted layer there that I, I'm pretty sure in a lot of those fields, I'll, I'll dig in some of those areas with standing water in a field that's been, that's been worked. And, 
and I'll have, you know, this, this wet soil on top. And then as soon as I get through that compaction layer, it's completely dry underneath. And it's really amazing to see that because it shows you how much that compaction can hold water at the surface and not let it move through that soil. Um, and so I, I think, you know, the worst case scenario would be is that you, you have tile drainage installed and you're intercepting the groundwater, which is really beneficial. But if you're not getting that, that movement of water down through the surface to the tile line, you're losing half of your, your ability to move water with that expensive investment. And, um, and so trying to figure out a way to get that, that water from the surface down to the tile line or down deeper in the profile where it can be stored for moisture use later is, I think, is, is really key. Um, and if and if water is being restricted as it moves down through the profile, imagine you know if, if roots can't go past that compacted zone to get at all those nutrients that may be down below, or explore the soil that's there. Um, I mean that's a that's a real bummer too. So so yeah, infiltration is is key, um, and trying to use practices which promote that infiltration. Um, one of the things I've seen is say you don't want to do the whole field and cover crops. So you're thinking about this fall and you're going to use cereal rye. And you're thinking, wow, I can't cover the acres I need to cover with cereal rye because I just don't have the time or I'm, I'm anticipating I'm not going to have the time or the, the manpower to do it. And one of the things you could do is, is just go in and seed the low parts of the field or the areas that you know you have issues with water, standing water or, or getting through them in trafficability. And maybe it's only 10 acres of a quarter, but if you seed those acres with cereal rye, um, get that in place so it can use moisture the next spring, you can really hop around fields and get that work done um, and get it done effectively. I have farmers that will just seed like the, you know, the, the, the headlands or something like that to get it, to get that management in place there. Um, and I think that can be beneficial. And then in that case, say you only have 10 acres out of 180 acres that you're putting corn on, I really don't care if you seed your corn right into the rye and then terminate the rye. I mean, you're, you're only doing that on 10 acres, um, and, and if it helps you get through that part of the field to see the rest, to plant the rest of the field, then, then I'd say do it. Um, but work on building the infiltration and, and managing the water in those areas that you really are having issues, um, issues managing. Yeah. I also had a situation last fall. You know, we had this big blizzard um, first week of October and our site is tiled and I went there to check the groundwater depths and and the water was literally um, sitting close to the surface, less than half a feet below the surface. And, and then I, out of curiosity, I went to the pump station and the pump station was not pumping the water because it was set up at a level where, you know, water had to get to a certain level. And it was basically, uh, the water was not uh, coming um, through the tiles into that pump station very slow, there is, it was a standing right there. So th I thought, okay, so if, if we don't improve the infiltration, tiles are there, but th the water is not moving through the soil layers and that's gonna ultimately affect how quickly we get rid of that excess water. Any more thoughts or questions? As somebody suggested to contact Dr. Shannon um, Os Osborne at the ARS in Brookings, South Dakota. She has some data um, which measured trafficability. So. And then there's a comment by, comment by Greg, I think. I just replied because I know Greg oh. knows that field oh. <laughs> really well. And so he can probably imagine me driving with that farmer across that field and seeing, I mean, we literally went through standing water on it and, and just, went right through um and that was pretty amazing so i don't know greg if you want to add anything because you've been working closely with with uh farmers in that area too um, i was just <clears throat> gabby knows i can get lengthy when i talk uh <laughs> that same field that abby was talking about and showed the pictures of um was barley last year and we only had volunteer barley on it after harvest because we couldn't get the rye established but this spring the residual effects of that barley using moisture and that no-till it looks absolutely incredible and same with the rest of the farm you know very little rye done last fall except for in those soybean fields uh, and there again there wasn't much at harvest time but now they're greening up and looking really nice yeah and those fields look just as good if not better 
uh, than all the fields around it, other than maybe uh, previous crop sugar beets. So yeah, that traffic ability. But the big thing is those wheel tracks at harvest time, the last two wet falls on the one field with tile or with no-till and, and cover crops, there's no water in those tracks. So it shows that that water moved down through those tracks and uh, versus the ones that were mudded out at harvest time, those ruts are still full of water this spring. Greg, have you been pretty impressed with how quickly those fields have come around? Um, oh, it's, it's, a, it's unbelievable. Um, in one of the measurements that I use for traffic ability or compaction is that soil probe in my truck. You know, a lot of the fields that are around that one that you know of Abby, um, my, my probe gets, my truck almost gets lifted off the ground trying to probe those heavy clay soils. And in my no-till fields, there's very little resistance to cut through that two feet. And the healing from underneath is faster than even the surface healing. So, you know, that um, uh, soil just, you know, there again, it gets to be all about infiltration. It, that improves so quickly in these clay soils. Yeah, sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated how quickly soils can rehabilitate themselves if we give them a little bit of chance. That's the key, I think, um, depending upon the system and depending upon the ear. But, you know, we, we could sometimes, some soil properties um, can improve quite fast, like organic matter, increasing the organic matter may take some time, but infiltration could be improved quite quickly compared to, for example, some other, like lowering the pH, for example, or increasing organic matter percent. Um, and then that's, these, these properties are also very helpful. I was thinking when, about one, um, <clears throat> so I mean, a cereal rise, obviously kind of a fall practice that would be put in place for next year to manage, but I'm, I was thinking about some of the things we could do this spring. Um, say your fields are wet and you need to, get soybean planted and you're, you may mud it in a little bit, um, depending on how things look. Um, and maybe you have some iron deficiency chlorosis issues as well, which can be exacerbated by some wet conditions. And so Dave Franzen and I put together a Soil Health Minute article for this past week, um, talking about using oats with soybean. And so having the oats in there to grow with soybean, manage some of the moisture and the nitrogen and um, help those soybean get established and, and grow. Um, so that may be a practice that, that people want to try this spring if you feel like the field is just a little bit too wet and you're worried about the soybean establishment or stand. Um, you could try some oats, um, oats in there or barley as well. Um, and there's a, the farmer, there's a farmer over in Minnesota that's, that's done some of that and, and done some trials side by side and he um, he put in about a bushel of oats with his soybean and, and he was very happy with the, with the establishment. So if you have IDC issues, that may be something you look at this spring to be proactive and start using some, some cover crops in your system. Uh, Greg, you wanted want to, to say something? <laughs> well, I was just saying we have another large um, couple field down north of Wapaton that got abused pretty bad last year just from the fact that uh, they were pumping uh, pond water out of the uh, sugar beet ponds because they had to fix a, a pond uh, liner and stuff like that and so we were kind of wet in the spring and, and then in the summer they injected another 20,000 gallons of water per acre and we got wet and rainy and, and it didn't look very good we could get the ruts leveled out but we went out there thinking, okay, we need some rye cover crop on there. So we broadcasted 90 pounds per acre because it was now dry and we didn't have a very good seed bed. And we hit it with a McFarland drag twice. We got a half an inch of rain on it and now every seed grew. So uh, we have 90 pounds of very dense cover and growers a little concerned because the air movement isn't there yet, but I've got to just kind of walk them through that whole transpiration and infiltration aspect there. Yeah, and we're gonna be planting soybeans in there. So it'll be a fun one to follow. But I think um, just for reclamation of the ground is uh, 
going to be very fun to, to show them how it, that occurs. Any more comments or questions? Any suggestions? Say, Greg, if I ever get to leave the house again, I want to come see that field. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Ken, I can give you locations if you want to sneak down the interstate. It's just south of Abercrombie. So, um, I'm going actually, to tell you not because this is being recorded right now and somebody may hear it. I may. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. yeah may, that is was great not, to may is an operative word. Uh, but the, I've, I've got a message into uh, Steve up there at Carrington to see if, if they've ever used uh, a plant growth regulator palisade on those really thick stands to see if it would shorten up the straw enough to where we wouldn't have the lodging. We may try and keep um, 80 acres out of that field just for harvest, but it would be a way of, of taking some of these to yield without the management concerns when we actually are very successful in establishing a stand. Nice. But I like this format. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a way for, you know, even in the future to do, you know, to expand your cafe talks live. Yeah, I like this format too. I think it's been really good. Um, it's been really good. And, and honestly, if, if people have more specific questions, I'm happy to, if you, if you know of 10 people that want to just hop on a Zoom call and talk through ideas, this works really, really well with 10 people or so um, to just kick around ideas and talk about how, to, how you're going to tackle something. So it could work really well, say, if, if somebody has a few neighbors that want to talk about cover crops or get some ideas, then, um, or, you know, then this is a really good way to get some of those ideas shared. You'll just have to have it from your kitchen so you can call it a cafe talk. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, man. We could name it differently. Kitchen talk or living room talk. Oh. Uh, you have a, a couple loaves of bread and you can call it uh, breaking bread session. Ooh, there we go. Yep. <laughs> oh, there's a suggestion for that. <laughs> <laughs> living room latte enlightenment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. Here's one. Yeah. Uh, using oats for a couple of years, seeded with soybean to help prevent soil erosion after rolling and for other agronomic advantages. Um, so yeah, Todd, and it sounds like it's worked really well. Did you want to talk about your experience with that at all or, or share some tips you may have? Um, yeah, we've been seeding oats with the beans, putting in a different box in the seeder. And um, mainly we've been having trouble with uh, soil erosion, wind erosion, after we rolled the fields, and it seems like it's helped. Um, you have to be mindful when when you spray, you not let the oats get too far along and take over the field, but um, it seems to have some other advantages just to have another crop growing out there, <clears throat> even though I don't like them right next to the soybeans plants, but um, it doesn't seem to bother too much. Yeah, so what is, it's a great way to get more plants into the system. Right. Like, and, and to build up a little of that residue. I know sometimes we focus so much on trying to get a cover crop after soybean and, and trying to fly it in or to, um, to get some, some residue that way. But oftentimes, like you're, like you're doing, planting the oats with the soybean to get some more residue in the system on the front end, and then hopefully it sticks around till, the, till after harvest um, could be a really good approach too. And I bet you get a little bit better weed management too with that. Do you, did you say, do you roll the, the oats down after, after you terminate them or? No, no, we just, um, we just plant the oats with the beans and um, then, you know, we come back with the roller to, to put the rocks in the ground and um, then we just eliminate the oats later on with the herbicide. Did you find any difference? Like uh, normally when we roll soybeans and if the weather is dry, there's quite a bit of soil blowing away. Did you find a difference where you... Uh, well, plant? that's that's the whole reason, the whole purpose of doing it. But um, the last couple of years, we haven't had as much trouble with the, the wind erosion. It just depends on the conditions and the weather. Mm -hmm. But I think it would it would help to a certain extent, and anything anything at all to hold the soil down. It's the worst feeling you have when you see your soil blown away. Yeah. 
thank you all for joining us um, today. We'll be back next Tuesday at 11 and we'll switch gears a bit. Uh, next Tuesday, our speaker would be Dr. Marisol Birdie and the, um, Dr. Birdie will, she'll basically talk about uh, selecting different cover crop mixes for different cropping systems. So it'll be same link. If you wanted to call in, I could see that today we had one person um, who was calling in. Um, I didn't know who, but I think it was a Minnesota number. So uh, same number, same link, same time, Tuesday and Thursday uh, for two more weeks. Well, thanks again. And see you guys on Tuesday. See ya. See ya.